You got that NPR voice, man. You need you need to do uh, a <laughs> you need to do a, you need to do like an NPR style show one time. <laughs> you just talk. You know, you talk with Guy Raz. Smooth. Do you watch uh, what is that? How I Built This with Guy Raz. I think I have seen that before. I don't watch it like all the time. Yeah. Regularly, yeah. He's just done some. Uh, he interviewed the. Uh, founder of dave's killer bread that was my first oh, podcast cool. that i watched with him and or, you know watched of theirs and uh wild ride i mean they you know they always start it with the most stressful yeah. moment of the story and they started it by him being like yeah man i was like high on meth and they wouldn't let me back into my building and i was like <laughs> really draws you in though right you know two and a half hour later you That's learned all cool. about this guy. Yeah, I got to go find that and listen again. My my favorite so. podcast of all time is Stuff You Should Know. If you've ever listened to that. Yeah, sure. It's, I've it's not listened awesome. to that one. Uh-uh. It's just all weird kind of facts. Like they just did an episode not long ago about, um, it's called The Nuclear Boy Scout. And it's about this kid who, mm. when he was in Boy Scouts, was there uh, back in the eighties? I think it was. There was actually a Boy Scout uh, badge okay. for like nuclear energy. And it was just like how to research, you know, nuclear power and this kind of stuff. Well, he took yeah, it right. a step further and actually created a nuclear reactor in his mother's flower shed behind <laughs> their house. And uh, it's a yeah. wild ride, but, but they just do random podcasts like Man, that, that's you know? awesome. and then they'll talk about, you know, is there really gold in Alcatraz and stuff like that? It's, it's fun. Mm, sure. Just kind of increase the yeah, breadth. Yeah. You just know a knowledge. lot about stuff that yeah, yeah, nobody yeah. really, you know, will ever ask you about. <laughs> yeah. Right. Great at parties. Did though. you know? <laughs> Yeah, right. That's great. Yeah. Um what else do you listen to, Derek? What do you what do you fill uh, your mind listen with? To? I'll listen to the Bible a lot, actually. That's kind of been my thing this year is um uh, I've yeah. got a, a daily habit now of opening up the Bible app and and doing my reading through like audiobook. And so I've got this routine where I, yeah. I listen to I, I'm following this plan. It's called the Bible recap. And every day it's a chronological thing. And every day you get like, you know, five yep. chapters and you read through that. And then there's a companion YouTube commentary where they talk about what you just read. And so I've been doing that. And so I'll listen to that in the mornings yeah. when I get up and get my coffee. And then um, I'll listen to this podcast. I'll listen to the guys, the work for it, the housemaid guys. Um Mm, yeah. Every once in a while, I pop over and listen to uh, Axe and Iron guys. Um, I used to really be big into uh, triathlon and running and stuff. And there's a really cool podcast. If you're into exercise, sure. go and find Zen and the Art of Triathlon. Um, and it's just this guy who's kind of talking about how he's training, you know, and how it's how he's working it into his yeah. life and all that kind of stuff. And that's actually between Zen and the Art of Triathlon and Andy's podcast when he used to do the coal iron, you know, was that you? I thought that was, that me. was you and Andy. Okay. That was me. No. No, Andy okay. didn't want to be on the podcast. And I I had heard again and again yeah. that we should have a podcast. And I used to listen to Gary V a lot and he was like you know, voice is the new thing. You got to be on yeah. voice. They're just going to be, you know? And so I was like, all right. So we were on vacation in Michigan and I was in a hot tub by myself and it was wonderful. And I thought, you know what? I'm just going to do it right here. So the very first one, you hear the bubbles <laughs> in the background. And so then I'd be in my little danger ranger with no exhaust driving home from work and I'd record yeah, it on okay. my phone. Well, and uh, my favorite part w- was when people would say, man, is that a 12-valve Cummins? That sounds good. Well, there weren't like, that many episodes nope. <laughs> of that original, you know. No. Yeah, no, I burned out pretty many. quick. Look, I get it. I get it. I've got a podcast. I've got a podcast. I think I have 70-something episodes. Yeah. And like 50 of those were done wow. two years ago. 
<laughs> and so I've yeah, only yeah, done yeah. like 20 since then. Yeah. But Zen and the Art of Triathlon and you, the way that you were doing the style of podcast just in your truck or, you know, walking into the grocery yep. store or whatever – that was the way he did his podcast, yeah. and that was I was like, well, you know, I'm just going to start doing yeah. the same thing. It gives me somebody to talk to, you know. Yep. And um, I enjoy it. Right. It's fun, right. you know. That's a good point. It's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think if you can go into it with a mind of creativity rather than trying to make a point, that's what I kind of struggled with was I always wanted to make a point, even though I was in these kind of yeah. haphazard situations. And so that – I found that really challenging. Yeah, That's yeah. what burned me out so quick. But I also think there's a natural part of our humanity is fits oh, and sure. starts. You know, there, there's just, there's a season and, uh, I, you know, I don't think that's wrong. I, I think it's, I think it's kind of fun to go back and see fits and starts previous. I friend of mine a couple years back, oh gosh, like 12 years ago, uh, filmed a Kickstarter video for me and I was trying to buy a press <laughs> And, uh, this was way before coal ironworks and he sent it to me and I'm sitting there watching, you know, I was like 80 pounds lighter <laughs> and, uh, just terrified, petrified yeah. on camera. I'd never been on camera before. And, uh, you know, yeah. fits and starts. This was fun. It was fun to go back and see what I thought was going to be at, I was trying to get tooling together to start a, uh, the Indianapolis tool company Very is what cool. I wanted to call yeah. it and make, axes and yeah. hammers and chisels and things like that and yeah. uh, did this instead well, it was, so yeah i think Seems that would have been okay. a really good move yeah, yeah. <laughs> i think I, I really liked yeah. hearing you know kind of yeah. your 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 thought process behind what what you were going like yeah, i sure. think there's one episode back then where you were talking about you know the the hurdles that you were having to go through to get electrical in the new building yeah. that you were going to at the time yeah, yeah, and just you know, just hearing yeah. Yeah. somebody talk about their thought, talk through their thoughts about how to do that, you know, because I was just starting at the time about thinking of starting an actual business, and and yeah. so it was very useful. It was very useful, you know. So I love. It. So awesome. as far as what That's a great I would, yeah, now Derek. that I know that it was you and not Andy, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. As far as what I listen to, that that's the kind of that, that's the style of stuff I want to listen to. I want to I want to kind of hear the yeah. why behind somebody's you know business or, or 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 you know what what's motivating them and how are they getting through these challenges? You know that kind of stuff. I, I, I just love it. You know. Yeah. When I I really love when they dig in and go granular and get give me the details of the day to day for that. You, there's a that how I built this podcast, he does the founder of, oh shoot, what is the name of that? What is the, the gold standard of Greek? Uh, the Oikos? Can't think of the uh, name. O-I-K. No, I think it was even before that. Anyway, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It, it's fantastic. Guy grew up as a huh. goat herder. Like in the middle, in the middle of nowhere, came to the U.S. on a visa, but he couldn't afford the housing to support his scholarship that he had gotten that gave him the visa. And so one of his professors at the college had a little hobby farm up in the, up in New York. And so he went and took care of her sheep and just the, how he remembered all the hmm. details of this. I don't know. The man is a multi-billionaire at this point. Uh, this was, he was the guy that brought Greek Holy yogurt cow. to the U S. Chobani. Uh, yeah. Okay. Chobani. Yeah. Chobani. Yeah, how I forgot that. Right I don't now. know, but yeah. So, you know, it was wonderful. And I, I love that granular. I, I want the details. I, I hate it when they just say, oh, yeah, you know, we went and got funding. It was rather challenging, but we right. got through that. And yeah. it's like, no, what happened? You know, like, um, so, you know, to follow that up, Derek, give me the granular details of how you're sitting across from me today. Tell me about your story, how you got into blacksmithing, how you hmm. became the man you are today. Uh, how I became the man, I made a whole lot of mistakes <laughs> in a nutshell. There you go. But how I got started <laughs> in blacksmithing, um, I actually started in making knives first. And so I went to a small 
private Christian college uh, right down the road here called Mississippi College. And in the 90s, uh, which is like that's back in the olden times now. But um, (laughs) there was a guy who came into the dorm one day. He had gotten up early and gone hunting, which is, you know, a big thing to do around here. And so he had gone deer hunting in the morning. And he comes into the dorm getting ready for class. And I think I was coming back from the showers or something, you know, and saw him in the hallway. And he had this weird knife sticking out on his hip, you know, in a in a custom. I could tell it was not a store-bought sheath, you know. And I was like, Ramsey, where did yeah. you get that knife? And he said, oh, I made it. And that was the first time I had ever, <laughs> you know, I'm born in 72. I was probably... 19 or 20 at the time. And that was the first time I had ever seen someone talk about making a knife, you know? And so yeah, I said, what do you mean you made it? And and so he started telling me that he had met this guy in town and, and uh, he had actually gotten hooked up with the Mississippi Forge Council, which was kind of just in its early years back then, I mean, long story short, I went to his house one day to kind of see what that was like, you know, and um, he let me yeah. do a little forging and we forged a little tiny arrowhead. Like we took a little bar, we put a point on it, we put a dub- double fuller in it and then chopped it off the bar and it looked kind of like a little arrowhead and we beat it up with a ball peen to make it look like it was flint napped, you know, just a little bitty thing. And that just flipped my world upside down. I mean, I was like, that's the coolest thing I've ever done. I've ever seen. I want to do more of this. You know, how do I, how do I get started? And so, um, I can't remember if it was Ramsey or if it was Steve Thompson, the other guy that taught me knife making here in Clinton. But one of them told me about this book called the $50 knife shop by Wayne Goddard. Mm, Yeah. And so I went and got this book and it was basically, uh, Wayne Goddard used to be, a he's, he's passed away now, but he was a master bladesmith in the old days. And he wrote a series of articles for blade magazine and it was called the $50 okay. knife shop. And, and this book was all of those articles in, you know, cover to cover. And it was like how to scrounge for mm-hmm. material, how to scrounge for tools, how to build your own tools how to build your own belt grinder. It had, it basically had very rudimentary belt grinder diagrams in there. And so I, I wore that book out, you know, cover to cover, did everything in the book, built all the tools in the book and basically built a little tiny workshop in my garage at the time, which was two pieces of wood across two sawhorses, a little single burner forge (laughs) that I built. And, um, one anvil that I'd scrounged from some guy at the Forge Council, a couple of hammers that I dug out of my father-in-law's junk pile on his farm, and I'd rehandled. And I went to work. You know, I, I went to, I started trying yeah. to make knives and um, did a lot with a local guy here named Steve. And uh, he had a knife shop. He had a really nicely outfitted knife shop in a U-Haul rental storage mm-hmm. building. So, you know, these storage okay. buildings where you just have roll up doors yeah. and you throw all your junk yeah. in there and you pay them a hundred bucks a month or something. His, I think it's his uncle owned a storage facility like that. And he let Steve have one of these yeah. long, narrow storage buildings. And so, uh, Steve said, come by my shop one day and you know, I'll show you some stuff. And so I uh, said, so where's your shop? And he said, well, it's the U-Haul storage place right down the road. And so. <laughs> I pulled in this <laughs> rows of storage and there's his pickup truck next to one of these doors rolled up. And in that building, he's got like, it, it was a knife maker's paradise for me. You know, he's just junk everywhere and tools and grinders. And he had built himself a treadle hammer and it was just awesome. And so I would go there after work. I would pull my truck over there and uh, I would bring my little single burner forge and set it on the tailgate of my truck. And, you know, he'd show me stuff. And, and so I did that for, for quite a while. And, and then my kids came along and then, uh, when my kids came along, Mm. I did nothing for like five years (laughs) or so. I mean, I didn't light a fire Mm. and, uh, 
then my son got into Cub Scouts and uh, they had mm-hmm. the metalwork merit badge. And I thought, and one of the, one of the yep. tracks in the metalwork merit badge is like build a lantern out of 10, you know, so it's like 10 smithing. And then one of the other tracks is blacksmithing, yeah. you know, and I was like, yeah, Hey, I can, I can, I can help do that, you know? And so I've got all the old equipment <laughs> out again and it just, it kind of lit the fire under me again. And I've been at it ever since. And, yeah. uh, yeah. and I left knife making, uh, shortly after I did forged in fire, I just, I was kind of tired of it and, uh, took some blacksmithing mm-hmm. classes and really got into, uh, the blacksmith side of things and just realized that, um, as long as I'm forging something, I'm having a great time. But the minute I step away from forging, yeah. the, the fun kind of stops for me. And so, you know, I love yeah. to forge knives. Ah. I've got a coffee can full of knives that I've forged but never finished because I just once I finish yeah. forging it, I'm kind of like, oh man, now I got to grind and you know I got to do all this other stuff and <laughs> and so I've just I've been really happy sticking yeah. on the forge work side. So that's kind of how that's I got awesome. here in a nutshell. Yeah. So you've got this path forward that you followed that landed you here. Tell me about how you arrived at the the offerings cuz you you spoke about this when we had our when you, when you were demonstrating at our Andy Davis Hammer in and you said you had kind of veered away from some of the bigger work because you realized how much more efficient you could be making smaller things things that fit in the induction that you could tool up for and run quickly on so tell me a little bit about your thought process yeah, behind so, that and how you arrived um, at that I was doing a lot of what I think you started doing making hammers and axes and tools and stuff for mm. other blacksmiths. I, I, I caught the hammer making bug for quite a while. And, you know, once you catch that bug, you know, it's like, yeah. it's not leaving until you've made all the hammers. And so <laughs> I made all the hammers that I wanted to make. Yeah. And, but then I realized I was like, that's kind of a time consuming process. And I, I enjoy this, but yeah, very... I'm not, I'm not making the money that I think I can make. And so, um, mm-hmm. I was at a craft show and saw this guy. He had a table full of small items, you know, and he was selling keychains, forged keychains, and steak turners, and bottle openers, and lots of stuff that you can make in a fairly short period of time. And he, and he was just killing it, yeah. you know. I, I just kept walking back by this guy's yeah. table kind of interested because he was a blacksmith as well. And I was like, you know, what's he selling, you know, and he was just killing it with all this small stuff. And so that, that was kind of where I was like, okay, I need to do that to, to pull in the money to buy, you know, sanding belts and propane and all this kind of stuff. And so I I thought, let me develop just a few small things and try to do them really well, make a process where I can, you know, uh, an order will come in, I'll grab the material and bang it out in 30 minutes. I can have it in the mail, you know? And, and so mm-hmm. I, um, I decided to focus really narrowly on that small list of products just to kind of see how it would go. And so I started saying no to everything because like most people that do this, you start out with a list of custom work. At least most, most people do. They mm-hmm. start out and, you know, their, their aunts and uncles and ordering right. things from them. And then their aunts and uncles, friends are ordering things from you. And then you kind of get, uh, an audience, you know, locally and people are buying from you. And then you start getting people like, Hey, you know, can you make me this pirates of the Caribbean, you know, sword, or can you make me this funky hammer, right. you know? And so you start taking down this list of custom work. At least I did and fulfilling that. But it's like every job is completely different. And so I was having to retool and change Mm -hmm. and, you know, learn something new every time, which is which is fun for some people, I think, to do something different every time. But it was frustrating to me and it began to be soul crushing to me working on what other people wanted me to make rather than what I because I had some ideas in my head. I was like, you know, there's things that I want to do. Right. And I want to get better at. So 
Uh, the only way for me to focus yeah. on that was just to shut that custom list down. So uh, at one point, I had a, mm. probably 30 or 40 people on this list, and I just I emailed them all and said, I'm sorry. I can't do your work. I'm not going to make the thing you asked me to make. I hope you understand. I'm trying to take my business in another direction. I may make these things at some point, and if I do, you know, you can buy it then. But I'm going to move to a model where I make things and put them on my website and sell them. And I don't think a single person yeah. came back with anything other than awesome. Glad to hear that, you know, no hard feelings, you know? And so that was kind of a freeing moment for me yeah. to go, okay, I can do what I want to try to do here. And so I, I made like five little things and two or three of them were little small keychains, you know? And I just started kind of pushing those on social media and and that small list of things kind of started taking off. And um, and so I've just slowly added a few things to the list every year to where, you know, the list of products on the website is growing a little bit. And then I think two years ago, I decided to try to make some stake turners out of railroad spikes. And for whatever reason, uh, I, I hit some interest point there and um mm. immediately sold a big batch of them and i thought wow that's weird you know what's what's up with that you know why why is a railroad <laughs> spike stake turner selling so well and so i just decided not to question it and just said okay well, i'm just gonna lean into that i'm the railroad spike stake turner guy now yeah and and so i <laughs> leaned into it pretty hard and then I added a railroad spike fork and then I added the spatula, you know, and then I did the three piece set, you know, and it's like, it's not, it's only gotten, the demand for those has only gotten higher. And so I'm just like, uh, at All one right. point I was kind of getting frustrated. I was like, do I want to mm -hmm. be the railroad spike guy? You know, is that what I want to be known for? Yeah. And then the other part of me was like, you got two kids in college. That's not a question that you need to be asking yourself <laughs> at the moment when people are trying to buy things. From right. You. And so right. I just was like, you know what? I am yeah. having fun forging these things. So let's just yeah. press the pedal down and go with it. And so that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. I'm 150 orders behind right now. For railroad spike oh drilling tools. Gosh. Oh, so what's your big limitation uh, there? Time, being able to because this is not up. a full time job; it's a part time thing. Yeah. So you know, it's it's right. early mornings, lots of right. late nights, and every minute of the weekend I can squeeze in. So mm. you know, I yeah. I've thought you know can should I should I try to bring somebody else out to help you know and. Um, I think right. you talked about this at one point, you know, there's, there, there comes a point in your business where you have to realize you are not the only person that can make the thing that you can make. And I've been kind of feeling right. that way for a long time. It's like, right. well, I want to know that everything that yeah. leaves my shop is made by my hands, you know, and that's just at some point right. that becomes really silly. Yeah. Well, I think it's a fork in the road. Because one of the things that I've had shown to me even recently is, you know, I'm working with a company out of New York um, for some new marketing things. And they sent over their pricing sheet. And the guy, I found the company because the guy that owns the company does a YouTube channel. It's kind of, excuse me, it's kind of like Gary Vee, but like <laughs> negative a thousand. So he, but on the pricing sheet, you can say, I want this product. I want this product and I need some design help. And then he's got another tier. I want design help with Jake and the other design help is $75 hmm. and his is a thousand dollars. And so I, I think what I'm realizing at this stage was, you know, we made the decision to, uh, hire train. And that was our way of scaling. You can also 
outsource certain aspects of the job. And, you know, if you had three or four local blacksmiths do different products for you and you were the QC over and manage the process, the sticky point is uh, finding the people to do it, but they are there. But finding the people to do it, you know, if they're doing the work in their own shop, it's even better because it's yeah. all contract work. It's easy peasy, super clean. The moment they step in your shop and start using your tools, mm -hmm. that's an employee. And so now not only do you have to take on more work to make the same amount of money personally because you have to cover this additional cost, that amount of work might necessitate half of mm -hmm. another person because the workload might have to grow so much, right? So then the other option, the third option, I guess it's a triple fork, right? Uh, a thwork. Uh, so that would be uh, you, the people that want Derek Melton's product made from Derek Melton's hands yeah. get to pay yeah. this amount, right? And, and you know, it's, it's a simple game. When I, Andy's dad is a prolific mm. businessman. This, I mean, you're talking about generational family development of corporations. Um, and he, whenever Andy and I would sit down with him and we'd say, like you just said, I'm, we're 40 presses deep and I'm working 90 hours yeah. already. Yeah. What do I do? And he would always just say, oh, just charge more, <laughs> you know, and it was yeah. just so clear and easy to him. And it's like, well, yeah, but then less people get it. He said, yeah, but you have to make less, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, you know, so I, I definitely think I dealing with farmers in the farming community, I find a lot of people get really tied up in the virtue mm. of growing their own food and supplying that high quality food to the people around them. They get so tied up in the virtue that they exchange profitability and I had a recent conversation with a farmer that was doing uh, pastured broilers, okay? So he's selling his uh, chickens, and they piece them and sell the pieces at, at farmer's markets. And he was saying that he would have to charge, uh, it was almost $20 a pound to become huh. profitable. And because of that, he thought he was just going right. to yeah. stop. He was he was going to stop doing the work. And my retort to him, which which brought me a lot of clarity as I said it was I think it's a greater error to cut off access mm. to this. Like it's a, it's a, it's a lesser virtue to pursue not overcharging perception, right? Not overcharging your customer, but a totally eliminate access to this incredible food, this incredible value ridden product that they can feed their families. Like if it costs $20 a pound to produce right, it, yeah. it costs and $20 a it, pound. Like it. it's, mm -hmm. they want it and they will pursue it. And so, you know, um, and his response, uh, up to that point had been, oh, I'll never raise a prize. You know, his response was, that's a good point. It, it is worse for them, for these families I'm feeding, because it was like 150 families to lose access to my product entirely because I'm just not going to do it, you know? And so it's like, I think there's a certain level within the small batch producer like yourself and myself where we have to make a decision to, it has to become worthwhile without that stra stress and strain like you talked about, man. 150 orders deep is yeah, no laughing yeah. matter. <laughs> That's... That can be stressful. I know when we were behind and now we, I don't know how you have it set up. We would take money up front. And so now I've got this customer's cash right. deposit sitting in a bank and he's 16 weeks out on order. So he's calling us and emailing us. And it's like, I'm trying to track down all these parts and pieces to come together at the proper time. And, uh, you know, God willing, I never find myself in that position again, but um, well, it's, it, anyway, it's how you handle I, it. You yeah, know, I, 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 my, my business model has been, I, I, since I've, since I started the business and brought the website up, it's always generally been, I take money up front and then I deliver, but I've, but I've kept the, right. the website and the stock levels at a point where I know that I'm not going to get overwhelmed. So I only make so many things available on the website yeah. because I know I'm going to have time to get that many out in that week. 
Um, right. And that's worked right. pretty well. Right. I've been able to just dial up my busy level, yeah. you know, based on what I know I have as far right. as time. But two weeks ago, that that all changed. I, I had a massive social media uh, virality event, I'll call it. You know, I, I made a <laughs> silly little video of me flipping a steak on my grill. Literally wasn't thinking about it at all. I mean, was not thinking about, is this good for my account growth? Is this going to go viral? Wasn't thinking about it (laughs) one iota and just was at the grill cooking steaks for the family. And I thought, this would be cool. And so I just whipped out, took a 15 second video of me flipping the steak with my steak turner and posted it to Instagram and TikTok. Both platforms, both platforms, like millions and millions of views, like went nuts and and instantly within like four hours I was getting traffic alerts on my website and and all my products that I had you know which is only like 10 items in each product because that's how I'd been doing things yeah everything sold out right really quickly and I was like what happened so I went back and looked and saw that the posts were going (laughs) viral and I was just for the next three days I was slammed with two things People arguing over in the comments over whether or not I was cooking the steak right, which is part of the reason, part of the reason <laughs> why it went viral. You know, arguments <laughs> equal virality. And right, I found right, out real right. quick that if you show yeah. an improper cooking technique, buckle up because people are coming for you. And so, you know, I <laughs> apparently did some things wrong when I was cooking the steaks and people just went nuts. And so anyway, that was the first comment. The second comment was, how can I get one? And so Mm. I went and talked to my wife and I was like, you know, this is, this is a big demand coming at me. And if I just keep the business the way it's been, where I, where I just ensure fast delivery times, if I do that, I can't meet this demand and I miss this opportunity. And so she was like, well, why don't you just do a pre-order, you know, just, just change it to where it's instead of, you know, you get your item in five to seven days, you get your item in two months and just see what happens. And so I did, I went and changed all the product descriptions. I said, this is a pre-order. You'll get it in June, you know? And I thought, okay, you know, (laughs) this is, this is going to kind of tamp down this order because people are impatient and they're not going to want, well, it didn't. Sure. And so it just, I cranked the stock levels way up and I said, it's a pre-order. You'll get it June, maybe, you know, and just (laughs) a flood of orders came in just, you know, a massive windfall of orders came in. And then I was like, okay, now what do I do? (laughs) And so, and so then, and so it's, yeah. it's kind of been that way for the last two weeks. Like every day it's just order after order after order coming yeah. in. And so my way of handling it has been yeah, to awesome. be super upfront with all these orders that are coming in and I'm yeah. sending out an email every week Yeah, and I'm just saying, Hey, here's an order update. Yeah. I am shipping order numbers blank through blank right now. So you can look at your order number yeah, in yeah, your email great. and you can, you can kind of see where you're at. And if, the time frame is not acceptable yep. for you. If, if waiting until June to get it doesn't work for you, just let me know and you'll get a refund instantly. Yep. And um, so far I have, I've had yeah. some people come back, you know, in the last week saying, Hey, where are we at? You know, but nobody's asked for a refund, but yeah. it's um, so I had, yeah. I had to kind of pivot a little bit with how I'm doing things. Yeah. But that's, you, you, yeah. you know, about this, this is what you got to do. You know, you, you, about the time you think you got your business absolutely where you're comfortable with how it's doing you got to change yep yeah well i think yeah. yeah we've definitely done that a few times and we we've from the worst period uh, we were doing a tour the other day and i was showing people around the production area and stuff and talking to them about how how we build the process and how we think about the material comes in one door and the finished product goes out the second door and you know, that was uh, in pursuit of getting what was initially up to a 16-week lead time. And I've had presses that have mm. been 18 months. I mean, when we 
like you said, when we did custom builds and everything's different and I, I can only buy one, one of this and one of that. So the prices are astronomical and it was really complicated. We, we recently did quote a custom build. Um, and I mean, just the cylinder for the build was going to be almost $50,000. So, you know, that's a huge yeah. stressor. So yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you on the custom build side. It's like you, you have to have all of your systems so dialed and then pre-engineer your options mm. so that they all fit together. And then it's easy. Then it's a dream. But, uh, you know, we pivoted from that and then we pursued, okay, we're going to be the Amazon of the forging presses. So you place an order, it's out of our warehouse the next day. Okay. So then we hyper focus on getting our presses built quickly and we miss details, right? Cause you have to have everything perfectly leveled. So in, uh, in, I don't know if you're oh, familiar yeah. with yeah, lean yeah, manufacturing absolutely. or mm -hmm. TPS and Toyota production system. So Hijunka, the leveling of the production load is so basically, uh, they hold three hours of inventory mm -hmm. in the Toyota production center. And so every three hours they're getting deliveries of product and that material is going out of the truck onto the line in order to the orders being placed so that the chairs, it's not all one style of and color of chair. It's whatever the production order was. So you'll have a Camry seat, a, I don't know, Toyota names, it, different right. seats, different colors, different options. Cause they like to put different models in the mix. Um, again, to help level the load. So they're never doing too much of one thing. So, uh, anyway, it's <laughs> very hard to do, <laughs> it turns out. And so that was really hard. It took us a couple years and then we got there. And by the time we got there, the opportunity that we had been at, you know, especially during COVID, I mean, we saw 400% growth during COVID, just massive explosion. Yeah. I'm hiring people left and right training, you know, we're bringing in truckload after truckload of material. Well, then the, the volume starts to drop and all these hyper efficient systems break down because they demand yeah. consistency. Yeah. And so, yeah, no, it's constant. It's constant. It's like, okay, so then what do we do now? Okay, well, so where we're at today, we pushed our lead times up to two weeks because I know no matter what, I could have nothing in the shop for that product and I can have everything built, oh, packed, yeah. and shipped yeah. within two weeks. No question. And so, um, again, just after that, like, I don't want to have that. I, I, I got pretty burnt out taking the phone calls and the emails mm. of people saying, where's my stuff? Because the difference between yours and ours is – when we got that order, we would place orders to our suppliers yeah, yeah. with that cash. So if they came back for a refund, it's like, yeah, yeah, sorry, you know. So oh my gosh, that was not a fun time. Um, you know, I I I paid my dues on that one. So, uh, but yeah, the, it, it, it's ever changing, and and I think that's what's held. You said earlier you like to hear what holds people interest, what drives them, what moves them along, and I I feel like what Andy and I did really right in the beginning was we were both blacksmiths, mm -hmm. but it wasn't about blacksmithing. Yeah. It was about yeah. problem solving. It was that creative manipulation of the circumstances to make it work. And, you know, I grew up on a farm. Everything was held together with baling twine and drywall screws from three barns ago. And, uh, man, you know, that, that ability to jump in and figure problems out and, and meet the changing tide. That's, that's what holds my interest. And, um, I feel like it's the most expansive creative expression I've ever, hmm. I've ever played with, you know, it's yeah. like the ultimate medium well, I mean, it is, a creative uh, is to build act, a business, you know, because you're having to, you're having yeah. to create new processes and solutions, you know, to meet the demands in yeah. an area that you are interested in blacksmithing, you know? And so, right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're, we're out there forging stuff today. It's like, that, yeah, I have the coolest job in the world, buddy. <laughs> like, uh, I get to play with all our toys and you know, we're, I, I have an idea for something. I go out to the guys and I say, Hey, I need you to machine this thing, I have, you know, drawing on a piece of paper. And, uh, they hand me a finished part and professionally he treated age 13 the next day. So it's just like, <laughs> it's just wild. But, uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the things that I, I think we did wrong 
was that feeling of needing mm-hmm. to do everything ourselves. And I've really had it expounded to me in a myriad of ways recently, hyper recently, of finding ways to become a springboard for other smaller makers. Um, you know, we have an opportunity with a national brand that we're working on some products for, and I wanted to package that product in a pallet wood box. I want to dismantle our pallets and I want to sure. make these boxes yeah. out of them, shipping boxes. It is super cool, but excuse me. My first thought was I'm going to go buy all the equipment. We need to hire somebody. And then I thought, you know what? I know a lot of woodworkers, mm-hmm. small time, small, you know, hobbyist shops. And this could be a wonderful opportunity for them to do a new product and, and start their own version of oh, what, yeah. what yeah. we already did. And so went out, found, found a young lady that, uh, I I've known for years and, um, and she made a <laughs> way better box than I could have yeah. because she's a carpenter. Right. I'm not a carpenter, you know? So it's like, um, and she's passionate about wood. Like I am not. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I think at this stage in our journey, at least I'm, I'm always looking for ways like these new products and things that we're doing and thinking about, I want to look for ways to leverage that. And I don't have to carry the overhead of a full-time employee or even a part-time employee. I can pay them as, you know, for their service rendered or, or I'm just buying a product from them, whatever, um, simplifies our relationship, makes our expectations very clear. Uh, and you know, so, um, Anyway, that that's something that I we've been working through recently that I've I've really been trying to think about is uh, I want to be a, a stepping stone for the creativity mm-hmm. community, and you know I want I want to make sure every opportunity is taken to support this local local community, uh, whether it's in Anderson or it's just you know, U.S. right, but uh, but yeah. So anyway, uh, a little bit back to your virality. So your video <laughs> broke the internet. Why were people um, upset? Well, for one, apparently a steak turner pokes holes in the meat. And if you poke a hole in a steak, uh-huh. all the juices run out. It instantly becomes a dry, dusty. Right. Because it's a it's a pressure bomb of, of moisture. Yeah. It just, so that, that yeah, was it ejects. Yeah, one Got of the it. number one comments was <laughs> you're going to let the juices out. And uh, or why don't you use a fork? That was another really popular comment. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> why don't you use a fork? Um, oh, and uh, I, when I when I laid the steak on the grill, so like in the video, I, I put the steak on the grill, and then I push it around a little bit. So I move it. So I laid it on there, and then I pushed uh-huh. it. And yeah. so they were really upset that I messed up my grill marks. You know, because if you, you know, you're supposed to get these nice grill marks when you put a steak down on the hot grill, oh, okay. and you're not supposed to touch it sure. until you flip it. Sure. Well, I laid it down, sure. let it sizzle for sure. like two seconds, and then pushed it. And apparently that's just terrible. Uh, yeah. How could you? How and so then dare I, I kind of leaned into it. You know, I started wow. going, yeah, you know, I started arguing back yeah, with them course. and, you know, pushing, pushing that argument a little bit. And then I got like, a lot of people that were that that were already following me started jumping in, uh, you know, going to bat for me in the comments, and so <laughs> it was a very time-consuming ordeal, you know, uh, having to deal with all these comments. Yeah. But I bet. I mean, it was right. it was nuts. But you know, it was it, it was well, a, it was a, a business growing event, so I'm not complaining. Oh heck yeah, absolutely. So your your steak turner though is part of the set that you're going to be teaching right. during the Father's Day class yep. here at the Cole School. So tell me a little bit about that and how we how you're doing and what you're so doing. So we're, and why we're you're going to make it. the three piece set: a steak turner, a meat fork, so yeah. people can use a fork, and uh, and a <laughs> spatula, all out of railroad spikes. And awesome. um, I, I, I've got a pretty good handle on how to make those three items, and so. Um, I have never. <laughs> yeah. How many of each of those have you made? I've made I know I've made well over 2000 steak turners. And yeah, hundreds and hundreds of the forks and spatulas. Maybe, maybe not a thousand okay. in that yet, yeah. but a lot of steak sure. turners, you know. Yeah. And quantity begets quality. 
You get yeah, you good when you do it a lot. You know what I found was that I basically spent one entire year or last year or the year before, maybe two years now, where 95% of the things I made that year were railroad sprite grilling tools. And and then I would take mm-hmm. a break every once in a while and make a, a war hammer or I made a knife last year. And uh, it was like, it was interesting after making the same thing over and over and over, I'm doing a lot of it with power forging equipment, but I am at the anvil a good bit too, to refine and clean things up. And I found when I went back and made something else, I was like, man, I did that pretty good. I was, you know, and it just hit me. I was like, you know, (laughs) forging time is forging time, you know? And it's like, even though I'm moving the metal in the kind of the same way I have been, refining the process of how I make a steak turner over the past few years. Right. And that's translated to, yeah, to all my forging. So like when I go to make something now completely different, right. You know, all the, all the stuff that I've learned doing this one thing has helped me increase my efficiency and, and, uh, just my general overall forging skill in, in doing other stuff. And so that's been pretty cool. But um, yeah. I've never I've never taught yeah, a class on cool. how to do grilling tools, so I'm going to be flying by the seat of my pants. Yeah, really. You're but, but I've, you're I've such taught, a natural I've taught, teacher. I've taught though. other classes. I've taught several other classes on doing things, and this sure. is something that I do all day, every day. So uh, I'm not worried about it right. at all. But I, I am looking forward to. No, it's going to be a good. Mix. I, I've got a guy that's. Um, I do a men's group. Uh, in my shop on Wednesday nights. And uh, I've got a guy, we, we're making a knife in that, in that men's group over the course of eight weeks. But um, there's a guy in the class mm. that, or the group that wanted to do grilling tools. He's like, instead of me doing a knife with the guys, yeah. can I do grilling tools? And I was like, well, you know, I thought about it a little bit. I was like, I really need the whole group to be doing the same project, you know? But I'm going to get him to come back yeah. in a couple of weeks, and, and he's going to be my guinea pig student before I come to uh, to Indiana. So <laughs> I'll have a process figured out. Yeah, but I'm looking forward to it. I think it's going to be a ball. Oh yeah, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Oh, I think so too. Well, and that's one of the things that we're testing this new marketing program. We're doing like local marketing, which is totally different than social oh, media yeah. marketing. I I just you know. Advertising the school to a national audience is kind of the wrong well, move. It's quite a long way. You know, we have from here to Indiana, even within, <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, and we've got. I don't know uh, when we were doing the data, using the data service and looking at kind of perusing who we would be marketing to within a forty mile radius. I have oh, twenty thousand yeah. people with, and that's just yeah. with our initial data set, right? It's like. The opportunity to own Indiana uh, is is wonderful. Mm-hmm. I, I think that just sounds fantastic. Again, it goes back to that support your local community of makers. Um, but so we're testing that, and your class is one of the easiest to advertise because it's Father's Day. It you know you have a lot of openings in your class because you're doing three classes over two days. I mean that is just wonderful. So uh, also your 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 aura. Uh, I plastered you on the postcard, nice and big, you know, just, just showing off the Derek, uh, pretty scary. Man, we're, we're going to get him. All right. So, <laughs> so I'm fully and wholly expecting to fill your class out a hundred percent and you will be forced to come back and do a second yeah, class, twist my arm. but we'll see. Well, I, you know, I think there's, we'll see. All right. Talking about local marketing for this stuff. I think there's I think there's a market for that all over the United States uh, with all kinds of making, you know, here in the Jackson Absolutely. area a couple of years ago. Uh, and I think it's still a thing. But I remember seeing a lot of people doing these and it was primarily uh, kind of female oriented, but it was like a pottery thing, like yeah. bring your daughter and yeah. make pottery together. And so you'd, you'd book an hour at this place. You'd go in, you'd make a pot, you'd throw a pot and then you'd paint it and fire it and whatnot. And it, and it was like oh, yeah. this thing, you know, it, it got, I was seeing it all over social media. People were yeah. doing it, you know, like they were doing birthday yeah, parties yeah. there. And then I met a guy at a tire hammer class. He's in Alabama and he runs a school in Alabama called the blacksmith experience. And it's kind of the same kind of thing. You know, it's like he does date nights, mm. you know, where 
It just yeah. has an open shop and you can book an hour to come in with your date and forge a rose or a bottle opener or something, you know, and um, what a oh, fun yeah. date, you know, if you've never done something like oh, that yeah. before, what, yeah. how fun is that? And I've, I've just been thinking, man, there's, there's a big opportunity for that all over the place because people yeah, around awesome. here, especially there's not Absolutely. a whole lot to do. And so people are looking for, <laughs> you know, interesting things to do. And so, yeah. Well, even your your men's group that you're doing is a fantastic – I mean, that's making me think, uh, you know, getting with my small group and saying, hey, like, let's draw these men out. And let's mm-hmm. go make some stuff. I mean, we could forge axes and then go in the woods yeah. and butcher a pig and, you yeah. know, just like, come on. Because there's such a lack of that interaction because we're – as a society, we've removed ourselves from so much of our work. You know, we, we just – we have machines or somebody, other, some other country does that, or, you know, back in the day to harvest wheat took a hundred people walking in a line for however, you know, big the field was. There's just a lot more daily interaction um, in the midst of toil. And I, you know, I think we need to get back to that a little bit. I think it's a wonderful yeah, opportunity well, to do so too. Black what what I found is that, that. I, I have been taking for, or I have long taken for granted the the idea that that everybody kind of makes something every once in a while you know i mean i i my father was an architect and a carpenter and he made custom furniture in his Mm -hmm. spare time and so as a little bitty kid i was in the workshop with him watching him do his woodworking and make stuff he made he made wooden briefcases in the 80s and sold handmade wooden briefcases when people were carrying briefcases around all the time wow and so, you know, oh, yeah. being around a maker has been my life experience. And then I became a maker. And so it's like, I kind of take it for granted that people get to right. do this all the time. When in reality, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, the majority of people don't. Yep. And to give them the opportunity to, right. to get in and make something, whether it's woodworking or blacksmithing or whatever, you know, I have, my eyes have been opened yeah. to how much I was taking it for granted yeah. that what I do is common, which it's, it's really not, you know, and it feels common because we're in this community yeah. where we talk to each other all the time and we're all makers, right. you know? Right. Well, yeah. When you're a blacksmith and you get on Instagram and all your friends yeah, are blacksmiths, well, it looks like this. everyone's a blacksmith. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not yeah. Tri- quite the, the case, but uh, you know, yeah, it's easy to get in that bubble and feel, and I think it too can stifle, pursued a little bit. Cause it, 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 I've noticed it within myself. I don't want to try new things. Cause it's like, well, somebody else has definitely already done this. And you know, you just get in this little circle of everyone doing similar projects. And I mean, uh, the number of times that we'll, you know, talk in the shop about a, a new product we were, we're thinking of and we'll start working on it. And then somebody in the community will post that they, they already did it. And here it is. And it's like, <laughs> this is very frustrating once you get through five or six of those. Uh, but uh, anyway, we've got uh, we've got a super – and after this, I, we're, we're going to go back to it. Super awesome, very exciting top secret project that we're working on um, that is an absolute passion project, total godsend. Uh, we'll elaborate on it more, but I, I'm very excited to get it. And when you're here, I can nice. show you what we're doing. It's – it's pretty, pretty sweet. But uh, anyway, Derek, is there anything else you want to touch how, on today? Anything you'd like to, to tell the good people? How have said the word induction? <laughs> <laughs> because that has changed my world in the last. So I just want to throw in my two cents about induction forging here at the end um, and how I got into that. Um, I saw it first at yes, Clay Spencer's do. shop in Alabama, I went and took a a power hammer tools class, kind of similar, I think, to what Kurt taught um, a a couple weeks ago. I'm really aggravated that I couldn't attend that class. But um, yeah, that seemed like an amazing opportunity. But when when I went there to uh, to take that power hammer tools class, we were making spring tooling and clay went clay went over and Uh put this bar into a copper coal and pressed a pedal and 
I didn't know what was happening. I'd never seen anything like that in, in my life. And <laughs> I asked him about it, came back and yeah. immediately started researching and, you know, trying to figure it out and documenting it all. And, and I have been super excited to see you guys actually come out and be a vendor for that, you know, and a supporter mm. of it. And, um, I, I think it's a revolution that's just getting started. I agree. I agree. Well, and even going back, I think Grant Sarver yeah. was one of the first people to import them th- for, to the United States. I mean, that yeah, was in the 80s, what, he was, 80s he was early 90s. Out production tongs with induction forge and a screw press, you know. Yeah. And, um, right. I was right. like, and the technology's gotten better, but it's not that oh, different. Yeah. It does the same thing. You know, yep. you make the coil and it makes it hot. Pretty much, it's the pretty same, simple. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I am. You know, Andy and I were using induction years ago, and uh, I knew the first time that we used one that it was just something that we needed to add to the mm-hmm. repertoire at some point. But we, you know, we went through the process of trying to find a U.S. manufacturer, oh, yeah. and it was like yeah. pulling teeth, and. We got quotes. I got one company to quote me $40,000 for a unit. You know, it was a 15 kilowatt unit. or Actually, I think it was a 12 kilowatt unit uh, with no chiller. And I was like, hey, yeah, I think really we're missing the mark here, guys. Here. You know, it is. Well, it is because the technology is understood. Right. It's not yeah. elaborate. It's not beyond our capabilities. It's literally at this point, I'm almost convinced that people just don't want to yeah. do it. Yeah, I think. And so if I could figure out how yeah. to make them, oh, yeah. I would. Yeah. I it, promise It's you. the same as trying to cast but, things here you in know the, the U.S. You know, it's, it's very hard yeah. to find somebody yeah. to cast things economically, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We we looked into casting anvils, and we actually have a couple alloy pouring uh, shops pretty local to us, um, mm. one like 15 minutes north. We got through the whole onboarding process. They had approved our designs. We had a cost analysis, yada, yada, yada. And then out of nowhere, he came in one day and, and called me and said, yeah, we're just not taking new customers yeah. anymore. Thanks. And, you know, my next tier option – fell through and then it again and then again and finally it was just like okay uh, you know holland makes a right, great anvil right. we'll just let yeah. them do it yeah. <laughs> so no it's it's very challenging uh andy's great grandpa his name was grady uh and he founded grady foundry they do all of the like axle housings no for caterpillar huh. i mean you're talking large scale ductile iron um so if you if you're looking for things to get cast, I I do have mm. some references I cool. can get you in contact with. But I know you're doing the you're doing the uh, little the, the blocks. Those, what do you have those cast out of? Mini swages. They're done in China because I I couldn't find yeah. anybody here. Uh, but they're sure. sixty one fifty. Right. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, okay. it was it was a tool steel option that they had. That's kind of a strange alloy. And so I was like, yeah, yeah sure. that sounds great. Yeah. <laughs> Better than, yeah, yeah, better than mild. Better than yeah, mild, so better than cast. That was it. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. was not my decision, you know. Yeah. I was just like, I was asking, you know, yeah. what tool skill is going to be yeah. in there? Like 6150. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, man, that's that's a, a troubling experience to over and over again look around and think, yeah. I don't have anyone that yeah. can do that. The, and, you know, I do think it, it creates sure. a lot of opportunity. But yeah, the encourage the man. other the encouraging yeah. side of the no. of the you know I can't get this made in the U.S. or or I have to use something made in China mm-hmm. is you know I do have several things in my shop that are made in China, but everything I'm making yeah is I mean I'm an American so it's made here <laughs> yeah right <laughs> yeah yeah the inductions are hard but we you know we were able to to find a company. I, I do think there's probably three manufacturers in China that are making these induction forges and oh, we yeah. are just yeah. working with one, but, um, they are, um, the 25s are, are weird. They're, they're kind of complicated and, you know, we've had issues that we were, we were working back and forth with them on just because it's, it wasn't as straightforward as 
you have more output. There's kind of more sensitivity to the machine because it has mm -hmm. higher capability. And so you have to be, it's way more sensitive to voltage fluctuations. If you don't have six yeah. gauge wire feeding it, yeah. no bueno. I mean, it, it is very sensitive to, to that kind of stuff. precise with your um, coil uh, making. Too. That's become, yes, yeah. you do. You, you, and it's much more sensitive to proper, uh, how would I say this? like proper yeah. coil utilization, like too much, too big of a bar and too tight of a coil It'll, or vice versa can make weird things happen. It just doesn't, it doesn't, yeah. it won't push. Yeah. It'll it just, just says no. You. Yeah. And so you've got to get the right coil set up. You just beep at you. And so at first I thought, you know, we're having problems, but the more I've worked with them, they've really opened my eyes to no, this is just a yeah. way more sensitive machine. And uh, you know, the 15s are, you just put anything in it. It'll make, it'll get it. Hot. Right. It might take you a while, but with the 25s, when it gets set up properly is like nothing I've used. I mean, we, I had guys here and I melted one inch bar in 10 seconds to full liquid, Golly. like dripping on the floor. I mean, it's just like the amount of power is when we, we were working with uh, Brett mm -hmm. Onik from Bernie's Sky Forge, he's been doing woot smelts. And so he brought woots and we did some woot casting and woots casting. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm holding this like one pound block of molten steel um, in, in less than 10 minutes every and that was with soak time I mean, it was liquid in five Man, minutes that's fast um so when when you're here you're going to be really busy and i know that but we we should definitely scooch out some time to get you on the oh, 25 get, yeah we can do some casting i've got oh yeah we've got uh we had a 45 uh we did something naughty with it and the <laughs> igbt exploded which on 70 amps of 480 turns out to be really scary so a lot of wouldn't magic recommend smoke. Uh, <laughs> a lot of magic smoke uh, ejected quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I came back. It was sitting out in the aisle and Logan was like, I don't want to touch it. it. Like, just right, idea. We'll just leave just... it there for a little while. Just leave it there for a week. Yeah, that's no. awesome. So uh, anyway, but yeah, no. And, and man, you're the content that you generated around the induction was so well executed and so beautifully put together. It was clear. It was concise. It was educational. You presented things so matter of factly. I've always really admired that about you it was your way to just communicate things effectively. There's no hubbub. Well, it's just yeah, clear. Here it is. I'm happy to hear that. It's wonderful. But, but thanks. I appreciate that. I'm, 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 I'm an anti gatekeeper. <laughs> um, but you know, yeah, yeah. yeah. But I, I wrote that document out. because when I left clay shop, there was, I mean, if you go on the internet, it's like, how do I get an induction forge in my shop? There was nothing. I mean, there's really, there yeah. was a couple of places that were yeah. selling them, but there was nobody that was like saying, these right. are the things you need. To, to get one, you know, right. And then us solid came right. along and I'm pretty convinced that us solid read my document because like two months after I started using the TIG cooler, I was using, they started selling a painted TIG cooler that matched their machine. Like, I mean, literally it was right <laughs> after I did it, yeah. but that the chiller I've got from you guys, I cannot outwork it. Yeah. I can outwork that TIG cooler. Yeah. Yep. Especially here in Mississippi, but I can't yeah. outwork that one. Yep. I I have not outworked it yet. We've we had a guy using it with two mm. head units and he did not get the temperature to rise. Huh. The it's just a refrigeration circuit. It it's got the capability to outpace the BTU generation. It, I mean, yeah, the coils are gonna get hot and the electronics are getting warm. But when you think about the thermal conductivity of the metal that's getting hot over to the coil and then into the moving water. It's actually right. probably not yeah. that much. I, I would presume, but yeah, no, the, the chillers, yeah, when was, we got them in the first ones, it's like, this yeah. is amazing. It's amazing. We, when we've got our first ones, you know, we got a, I think the first two that we got were us solids and we built 
chillers for him. I had a 50 gallon drum of water with a little water pump and Mm -hmm. that worked okay. Uh, you couldn't move it obviously. Um, and then we, I, I built a couple other chillers. We used a laser chiller very early on. Excuse me. Sorry. Um, I just had a lot of Taco Bell. Uh, so, uh, and it didn't work at all. I mean, we had tons of issues with water pressure cause it would have flow, but it wouldn't have the proper pressure and all kinds of stupid, silly stuff. So, um, the chillers have just been wonderful and it's the same chiller for the 25 oh, cool. kilowatt unit too. And it holds up. So when we were doing those smelts, I never, never climbed a degree. Hmm. Obviously it gets warm in the, but as soon as that refrigeration circuit kicks on, do you, do you know if he's coming over. to a banner? It's done. I'll reach out uh, to him and ask him. Yeah, Brett. Brett? Yeah, ask him. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm sure you know, he would love to. I'm demonstrating the induction there, and and like what, day yeah. one of my demo there is just I'm just going to break out all the different coils and you know show all the different stuff. I would love to yeah. do a, like a little yeah. small smelting demo, you know, like a little small one, just to say yeah. hey, this is possible. But I'll reach For out sure. and see if he's if he's right coming and he's willing man i'd love to bring him over there yeah. and say when he's got all yeah he's got all the materials he's got all the lists and you know how to get the the carbon content you're looking for and and what other elements you need to add and hmm. i mean yeah he's he's doing some really wonderful things when he came out we were tracking times and he's you know adding grams of materials to the wow. to the billet and um it was super fun it was a lot of fun and then I went over and scooped a cup out of the CNC machine and he left. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, I think, uh, Derek, I think you have absolutely been such a wonderful partner with the inductions. Just like, I genuinely think a lot of people don't even know it existed and didn't know what the access point was. Right. It's like just showing them how to get into it, whether it's with us or it's with somebody else. Like, Induction is such a game changer, especially with these oh, small yeah. parts and pieces. Like I said, um, I think I think it's and I think it's just at the very beginning of it. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. But yeah, that's Wonderful. that's that's all I wanted to Well, sir, I don't want to take any more of your time. Induction. That's <laughs> I don't know how we got here without it. I genuinely don't. But you know, you're just <laughs> such a lovely man. You're just just distracting me. Just with your abs <laughs> and your triathlon. Those days are long gone. You know? I'm hobbling down. Every the road time now. I see you running, <laughs> I just feel so guilty. I chase animals that escape for short periods of time. Hey, far, That's far my only work is a workout. When you asked me I if I was my my mother's yeah. I mean my mother. My my wife's uh mother and father are they are they they live on a farm basically. And they've had horses and cows and yeah. all that. So it's a workout. Have you ever heard this? Have you ever heard the story of the marathon runner that showed up to the Australian like 300 mile marathon in no. boots and his overalls? This man was 65 years old and he won. He laughed. He said, so the, at this time, whatever this marathon style is, you can obviously tell, I don't know anything about marathons, but he, the, every, people would sleep at night and then run through the day. Well, he had grown up as a, uh, I think it was a sheep farmer and his job, his family couldn't afford a dog. So he said he would run with the sheep through the Holy mountains cow. for days on end. And so he like invented, he didn't, he just did it and other people copied him. But this whole method of running that's like low impact, but his first marathon, he ran in overalls and work boots and he won. And and the reason that he won was he didn't sleep. He ran through the night. That's amazing. I mean, it was just, Evan, can you find that guy? It's amazing. You should definitely, you should definitely read it. It's a sheep farmer, Australia, Merit. Yes. Right there. Running marathon. Cliff Young, the 61-year-old Cliff farmer I'm gonna write that down. who won a 550-mile ultra marathon, is wearing overalls up. and work boots and beat the next runner up by 10 hours. Good gracious. He, yeah. Yeah, he ran 543 awesome. miles. I don't really race Super much cool. anymore. So yeah, I definitely just check run that out. every other day so I can kind of eat what I want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
That's good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> you do good things. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, Derek, uh, where can people find you? I'm looking you? forward to June, man. Where can people find you on the internet? Uh, just, it's my name, DerekMelton.com. DerekMelton.com. Here, he's going to pull that. Drek, Drek, DerekMelton.com. Yeah, there's, there's Beautiful. actually, there's another Derek Melton on Instagram. Uh, we talk to each other quite a bit. Um, yeah. His name is Derek Melton, D-E-R-E-K, same way and everything. And he's a bladesmith. Um, and so he gets messages for me and I get messages from him <laughs> all the time. So we send them back each and other forth. out. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, yes, class in June. Uh, Evan, what are the dates for the class? That's a great Pull them question. up here. I just, I think it's 21st and 22nd. 21st yeah, and 22nd, weekend, yes. And those are, we got three classes. We're running three classes over over those two days. Uh, 200 bucks a head. I mean, this is going to be, I've got a ton of people that work for me uh, that want to attend the classes. So we're, we're, yeah, we're all really excited. This is going to be a lot of fun. We can. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun. When I can bring, I, I'll bring I'm some excited. steaks. I'll bring some big old T bones. We'll break out the charcoal grill and make some people on the internet really I'm mad. I'm going to bring. <laughs> <laughs> we can cook steaks incorrectly. Amazing. And blow the internet yes, up. Yes, got it. Um, I'm hoping. I'm having some parts made. I, I make these wrenches for twisting railroad spikes. Uh-huh. And so I'm going to try to make up enough of those to bring with Wonderful. me so that everybody's got some Wonderful. to use. Um, That'll be great. But yeah, it'll be fun. Yeah, it's going to be a good time. All right, sir. Well, thank you so much for spending this afternoon with us. And uh, absolutely looking Thanks forward for to me. some FaceTime in June. All right, sir. You have a good day. Yeah. Can't wait. Au revoir.